Uh, hello again, everyone, and welcome. This is the fifth event in the FAO's webinar series on enhanced transparency framework in the agriculture and land use sectors. I'm Susan Tarabi Parisi, and I will be moderating this session today. Um, to start, I would like to um, thank and welcome more than 70 attendees, and the number is going up. Uh, participants um, in this virtual room, our distinguished speakers and partners from the Global Support Program, Initiative for Climate Action Transparency, and UNFDTU Partnership, and of course, my own colleagues from the FAO headquarters and um, the country offices. Um, today, we will have an introduction to the adaptation reporting under the Paris Agreement with a focus on um, loss and damage assessment. Um, in the next uh, slide, you see the agenda of today. Um, to start with, we'll hear a few words on the general work of the FAO ETF team, including this webinar series. Um, then we will have an overview of adaptation reporting through biennial transparency reports. Uh, we will then continue with a snapshot of the FAO's work on the topic of damage and loss and how it could be utilized um, for the purpose of reporting under uh, the, uh, the ETF. And uh, last but not least, we will hear from country experiences in loss and damage assessment, anticipatory uh, measures in the agriculture sectors before we close the session. With that, I would like to hand the floor to Mirella Salvatore to kickstart the event today. Mirella, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for the introduction. And thank you so much to everybody for participating uh, to this uh, uh, amazing event. Um, first of all, you know, um, allow me to say that uh, this event is, as uh, Susan was already saying, part of a series under the capacity building project that uh, FAO is uh, running for addressing transparency in country. And for this reason, uh, we also set up a proper transparency network of practitioners uh, in uh, specific the agriculture and land use sector. So in, just in case that you didn't join our network, we really uh, love to have this opportunity to have you on board in the network and having uh, so many uh, of uh, the experts on adaptation and adaptation reporting uh, in, in our network. So it will be great if you can join and Susan will provide you the link in the chat. Uh, so you can uh, uh, easily just uh, have a look and uh, join our network. This uh, will allow you really to be part and uh, to be uh, contacted for any other future event and informed about uh, the work that we are doing on transparency. So um, I would like to welcome so much uh, our colleague uh, from uh, the UNEP-DTU and from the UNEP-GSP uh, under the umbrella of the collaborations of the ICAT, uh, because in reality, this event is a sort of a follow-up of uh, the events that our previous our colleagues did uh, just uh, recently where we started to learn from the country the needs of this specific uh, item that wanted to be addressed better, understand better what and how they can do it. And, uh, uh, and that is a really the spirit of also this joint event uh, to try to support each other also from an organizational point of view to ensure to give a next step forward for the country in, uh, uh, in learning how to address the non-transparency framework. So uh, based on that one, I really wish that this, the session will be really fruitful and very knowledgeable for you. Uh, feel free all the time to reach us out if you have any further question. Uh, and, uh, and also start also to send messages uh, through the network to our email to what you really think that your country will benefit to move to, uh, towards the non transparency framework. And we are really happy to develop something that really fits your country needs. So thank you so much. Susan, back to you. Thank you very much, Mirella. As you mentioned, this online learning session is a response to the interest expressed by many country experts to learn more about the element G of the ETF modalities, procedures, and guidelines related to loss and damage. Before we approach element G, though, we thought to have a brief overview of all adaptation related reporting elements through the BTRs. This topic is covered, as you mentioned, in a recent publication by ICAT and UNEP-DTU, uh, which I will share the link to in the chat. Um, 
And today we are pleased to be joined by uh, Thomas William Dale, one of the lead authors of this publication, who will provide us with an overview of this work. Um, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today and the floor is yours. Okay, yes, so um, thanks. As um, Suzanne said, I'm, I'm going to be giving an introduction of adaptation reporting um, through the Biennial Transparency Report. So the, the purpose of this presentation is to, to do three things. It's to first give you a quick and general introduction to what the Biennial Transparency Report actually is. And, and just for reference, I will now be referring to the Biennial Transparency Report from here on in as the BTR. Um, it's also to give you an overview of the information that its adaptation section should include according to the guidelines provided. And, and finally, to close, I'd like to also give an overview of some of the key challenges countries are going to face in reporting comprehensively against these guidelines. So um, starting from the bottom, I'm going to provide a quick overview of what the BTR actually is. So. As its name suggests, the BTR is a transparency oriented report that is to be produced by countries and submitted to the UNFCCC every two years. Um, it re represents a key component of the um, Paris Agreement's transparency infrastructure, um, otherwise known as the Enhanced Transparency Framework, which is intended to enable the COP to track collective progress being made towards achieving all the goals under the Paris Agreement. Um, the BTR's role within this framework is to operationalize the transfer of information from countries from countries to the UNFCCC. And this includes information relating to mitigation, vulnerability and adaptation, loss and damage, support provided and support received. Um, so, I mean, countries have already been reporting to the UNFCCC via a number of instruments up until now. So in terms of what will what will change once countries start be start beginning to report through the BTR. Um, the biggest differences related to adaptation are that, firstly, countries will now be able to report on adaptation every two years. Uh, this is actually quite a big change since under the current arrangement, countries can only report on adaptation once every four years through their national communications. Um, secondly, countries will now be able to report on loss and damage, uh, which wasn't strictly possible according to the guidelines of other instruments that are presently available. And finally, um, reporting on adaptation through the BTR is intended to be more comprehensive and of a higher quality than reporting that is presently occurring through the national communications of countries. So moving on to the uh, main purpose of this presentation, I'm now going to give a quick overview of what adaptation related information, the guidelines for the BTR, actually request. So the, the guidelines for the BTR are detailed in decision 18 CMA.1, which were released after the Katowice COP or COP24. And within this document, the, um, the guidelines for all the ad BTR's adaptation section um, can be found divided into nine sections, which are A to I. These sections serve to divide the many requests contained within the guidelines into general areas of information. Um, now, using the titles of each section as a general guide, um, one can immediately get a good indication of what kind of information should be included within a BTR's adaptation section. Um, now, as one would expect, uh, the major share of these guidelines are focused on how countries should report on their adaptation processes. And these are covered by sections A to F, which are highlighted now and provide instructions on how countries should report on all aspects of their ongoing national adaptation process. Um, breaking this down a bit further, uh, we can see that sections A to D of the guidelines are asking countries to report on all, on the different stage, uh, sorry, they're asking countries to report on the different stages of their adaptation planning processes that they've undertaken thus far. So meeting these guidelines would essentially mean reporting on everything from the results of climate change projections and vulnerability assessments that they've conducted to reporting on the adaptation measures that they've selected to overcome the key vulnerabilities and risks they've identified. Um, the vast, as the vast majority of this information is the result of past planning processes, one would expect most of this information to come from previous planning documents. And th this could include, for example, uh, national and sectoral adaptation plans, strategies, and also NAPs. Um, so moving on to sections E and F of these guidelines, uh, these still relate to adap 
uh, reporting on adaptation and ask countries to provide updated information on how their adaptation plans are going or, or have gone. So in particular, these sections are asking countries to provide information about how the implementation of planned adaptation is progressing and what the results of implemented actions have actually been. And with regards to the actual results, um, the guidelines in section F, which is requesting the results, are actually quite comprehensive. And as well as asking countries to provide information about the observed outcomes and impacts of adaptation actions, uh, the guidelines are always also asking countries to provide evaluations of how successful these actions have been, in particular in terms of their effectiveness in achieving the desired result, their adequacy in relation to the climate impacts that they're facing, and also their sustainability um, over the medium to long term. Uh, providing such evaluations is going to require countries to establish and use monitoring and evaluation systems that enable data provided by indicators and and other data collection techniques uh, such as surveys and, and what have you to be access to be assessed by experts who can then evaluate the various dimensions of adaptation success based on this information um, alongside the guidelines for reporting on adaptation section G um, provides countries with an opportunity to report on loss and damage within their BTRs. Um, now the guidelines for reporting on loss and damage um, are relatively novel under the UNFCCC. This is the only instrument which actually has guidelines on doing this, but they're nowhere near as detailed or comprehensive as those provided for adaptation. And the guidelines provided can broadly be understood as asking countries to do three things. Um, the first is to, to report on losses and damages that have been or are expected to be suffered as a result of climate change. The second is to report on measures that your country is implementing to manage present and future losses and damages. And the third is to provide information about institutional arrangements that your country has established or is using to facilitate the management of loss and damage. Um, and Section H, meanwhile, also not relating directly to adaptation, is asking countries to provide information about activities that support adaptation processes at national and international levels. For example, guidelines within the section are asking countries to provide information on uh, international collaborations and networking events that the reporting country is involved in. Um, and it's also asking countries to report on efforts to strengthen systematic observation systems and also research related to adaptation. Finally, section I of the guidelines um, does, doesn't actually ask any countries to provide any information or specific information per se, but instead it allows countries to include any other information related to climate change impacts or adaptation that's otherwise not included by the guidelines. So essentially this acts as a mechanism to let countries report on anything they feel the guidelines has missed, but they want to report on. Um, okay, finally, um, before concluding this presentation, I would like to provide an overview of some of the key challenges countries are going to face in reporting comprehensively against these new guidelines, um, particularly the new and improved aspects of these guidelines for adaptation reporting. Um, in particular, I'm going to focus on the challenges that countries face in reporting on, firstly, adaptation results, and then secondly, loss and damage. Um, so starting with the area of adaptation results, so the greatest challenge that countries are going to face in reporting on the results of adaptation is that many countries are, are yet to develop and operationalize systems for monitoring and evaluating their key adaptation actions. So in other words, they, they don't yet have ME systems to, to track progress in their national level strategies, plans and policies. Um, and this, this sort of sweeping statement particularly applies to systems that can actually evaluate whether these actions have been successful in achieving their overall objective, objectives, which would be reducing vulnerability or increasing resilience. Um, generally speaking, um, the development of these ME systems for adaptation have been hindered by a mix of practical and methodological challenges. So practical challenges would be things like a lack of financial, technical or human resources that are required to operate such a system, and, and these aren't necessarily small. While methodological challenges would be those associated with evaluating adaptation. And with regards to the methodological challenges, while there's a wide range of interlinked challenges that stymie monitoring and evaluation uh, of the impacts of adaptation or, or the results, the key challenges 
or two key challenges include the fact that there's no universal or off-the-shelf metrics for monitoring adaptation results, um, which means that countries have to spend a lot of time and effort designing and developing their own context and local specific metrics, which can take time, energy and resources, and also the fact that there's no widely agreed methodologies for assessing uh, key concepts such as effectiveness, adequacy, and sustainability of adaptation. And the assessment of this is, is key to understanding if adaptation efforts being implemented are enough in the present and the long term. And, and finally, with regards to um, reporting on loss and damage, um, probably the greatest challenge facing countries um, wishing to report on loss and damage is the fact that there's a general absence of robust and uh, robust approaches and methodologies for fully evaluating loss and damage related to climate change at present. And, and in part, this is partially due to the fact that the loss and damage field is still relatively new, um, particularly uh, in relation to adaptation and mitigation. And as such, many methodologies are still in the process of being developed. And obviously, we're going to hear about one, one of these later today. Um, however, um, you know, the fact that, um, that these uh, methodologies and approaches haven't yet been fully developed is also because there's you know, large methodological challenges in, in fully capturing and quantifying loss and damage due to climate change. And, and you know, this, this can be a complex process that requires high quality data and can involve dealing with a great amount of uncertainties. Um, in particular, assessing loss and damage can be tricky when, wants to, when one wants to assess loss and damage due to slow onset events, which is difficult to evaluate due to the inherent uncertainties associated with assessing impacts over long time horizons, or the long time horizons that slow onset events are occurring over, and also assessing non-economic loss and damage, which is difficult to evaluate um, due to the non-tangible nature of non-economic non loss and damage, which means that it's difficult to quantify generally, but particularly in, in economic terms, which would obviously make it comparable and, and easier to um, understand and handle. So as such, you know, when loss and damage is being evaluated, at present it's generally limited to focusing on the direct economic impacts of um, extreme weather events. And, and even then, it's often done so without full sectoral coverage. Okay, and that's my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the concise um, overview of uh, adaptation reporting under the BTR. I see one question for you in the chat, so I'll just read it. And um, the BTR will be effective um, on December 2024, 20, the latest. We will happen to country, uh, what will happen to countries that, that will, that have not submitted the BUR? Um, will this country continue developing BURs after 2024, or they will move to the BTR, and how they can bridge the gap? Um, okay, so so my understanding of, of this is that um, countries who are presently have secured funding for a BUR and are presently developing the BUR will still be able to develop um, the BUR, even if it goes over the 2024 deadline. Um, I I'm not 100% sure what the um, bridge the gap is is referring to, but I but in in regards to the the first part of the question, um, I believe that's the situation. I, I can see we have my colleague Fatima Zara, who's um, also quite into this uh, this subject area. Is 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 my answer correct, Fatima? Can I confirm or? <laughs> Um, if I understood, I cannot see the question in the chat, but if I understood properly, it's what happens uh, if countries do not manage to uh, submit the, the, the BUR before 2024, uh, whether they can continue with it or whether they have to submit a, a BTR. So the first thing I think to, uh, uh, to understand is that uh, the timelines that are uh, in uh, uh, specified by UNFCCC are for uh, countries, de developing and developed countries, excluding um, the LDCs and SIDS and those, it's at their discretion. So there is no hard lines for LDCs and SIDS with regard to the timelines for submission of, uh, of the BTR, though uh, they are, of course, encouraged to um, 
to comply with the, the other uh, timelines that are uh, specified for uh, for everyone. Uh, however, if uh, a country has uh, funding from Jeff to develop the BUR and are not able uh, basically to submit this BUR before the deadline, there would be provisions uh, coming in. I think uh, if uh, my memory serves me right, in uh, 2022, uh, with new modalities for Jeff funding that would be actually providing some bridge uh, funding so that countries can actually instead of continuing with the BUR, they can bridge that gap and uh, convert it to a BTR. So these modalities are not yet uh, uh, available for now, but I think it will be available in uh, 2022. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the great presentation. And thank you so much, Fatima Zahra, for, uh, for adding to um, to Thomas's response. I see a few questions in the chat, although they are more uh, related to the methodology and uh, the topic of loss and damage. So in the interest of time, I suggest we move on to the next agenda item and we will address those questions as, um, as uh, the meeting uh, progresses and maybe you find your answers during the presentation of um, our next speakers. Next up, we will hear from Elisa Di Stefano on how FAO damage and loss methodology could be used for reporting purposes in the context of the enhanced transparency framework. This presentation is recorded beforehand, but Elisa herself is in the room to respond to any comments and questions you may have. Um, let's watch the video together. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Elisa Di Stefano. I'm a work at the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment of FAO Headquarter. And here I will introduce the use of uh, the methodology to monitor the Sendai framework indicator C2 on direct agricultural loss from disasters in the context of the NAS transparency framework. Uh, my colleague, um, uh, Dira Kim will give a uh, more in-depth insight uh, in the methodology and uh, how the calculation uh, is made and, um, but, uh, in the next presentation. But here, I just introduced that the methodology can be applied to a wide, wide range of disasters, including climate-related events, and it covers uh, five different agricultural subsectors, namely crops, livestock, forestry, aquaculture, and fisheries. In the next slide here, we can see that as an integral part of the monitoring framework of the Sendai um, and as well as the SDG agenda, the FAO methodology can be used to monitor progress towards re the reduction of uh, the direct economic impact of disasters on agriculture. And it can be also used to report and to collect adaptation information for element G of the non transparency framework as per the modality procedures and guidelines that recommend the countries provide information related to action and support to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage associated with climate change impact. Here we have a more um, insight, a more detailed overview of uh, the different component of element G. Element G A um, refers to the observed and potential climate change impact, uh, including those related to extreme events, extreme weather events, and slow onset events. Um, the information here should be provided on the best available science, and the use of the FAO methodology provides a global uh, standardized definition of how damage and loss can be measured and um, it would ensure the consistency across countries, regions, and disasters for all agricultural sector. So the analysis uh, of the, and evaluation of the impact of the climate-related disaster can contribute to reporting under this um, element. On the other hand, on, this, on the next slide, we can see here that on the component B um, that refers to activities that are related to uh, advertising, minimizing, and uh, addressing loss and damage associated with climate change impact uh, as per the modalities, procedures, and guidelines. Um, can, in, for the information can be uh, collected through the establishment of an information system um, that requires several actions, um, including data collection, uh, managing of the databases, 
calculating uh, and analyzing the information, um, disseminating the results uh, uh, to policymakers. Um, by establishing the information system as per the FAO guidelines, um, um, institutional uh, capacity for monitoring, collecting climate related information on disaster in agriculture can be announced, as, uh, as well as uh, um, info the information um, to in the dissemination of information uh, to, for policy making and planning. Um, now, thank you. Um, I can share here my contact details and uh, we will have uh, a more in depth overview in the next presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, with this introduction, I would like to invite Virya Kim from the FAO Office of Emergencies and Resilience to walk us through the Sendai C2 methodology for uh, damage and loss assessment in agriculture. Um, and we'll get back to the questions afterwards. Uh, Virya, the floor is yours. Super. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Viria Kim. I am the DRRD for the uh, of the FAO of Office of an Emergency and Resilience. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting us um, to be here today to participate in this important webinar. Um, thanks also to Elisa for her presentation earlier, which already present and discuss or highlight some of the linkages on how the FAO damage and loss methodology could be used uh, in the context of the enhanced transparency framework. Now, it is important to point out that uh, we need to be clear on what the FAO damage and loss methodology could uh, um, offer. So far, it has been used only to quantify the direct uh, the economic impacts resulting from natural hazard induced disasters and extreme events on agriculture. On this basis, and with the heads of our statisticians, we can um, find way to expect and separate the climate induced extreme events and impact. Hence, this presents a link and a very good entry points to support the adaptation reporting. And uh, now, sorry, I just need to jump between my screen. So, okay. Okay, so I would like now to start my uh, presentation with this slide. Earlier this year, FAO released the latest report on the impacts of disaster and crisis on agriculture and food security, which is part of the knowledge product uh, on damage and loss and disaster risk reduction. Um, it is uh, the report presents the most recent trend in agricultural production loss attributed to disasters across all agricultural subsectors. And it analyzed the latest data to make a powerful case for investing in uh, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and resilient building. You can download the report uh, from the link provided in this slide. And uh, one of the most striking messages from the report is that uh, between 2008 to 2018, agriculture, including crops, livestock, uh, forestry, fishery, and aquaculture, absorbed 26% of the overall impacts caused by medium to large scale disasters um, in low and lower middle income countries. And if you have a closer look uh, related to industry, commerce and uh, tourism taken as a whole, um, agriculture on its own bears 63% of the damage and loss from, from disasters. Next slide. So um, with this slide, I would like to give a brief background on how the FAO damage and loss methodology was developed. So within the FAO, the work on damage and loss is co-led and uh, coordinated by the uh, FAO Statistics Division and the Office of Emergency and Resilience with substantial technical input from our technical divisions such as forestry, fishery, livestock crops um, across the organization. So the methodology was developed to address the needs for agriculture specific methodology with the emphasis on data disaggregation by commodity types. This is, this is really the most important thing. It's important to disaggregate data by, by commodity type, by crops types, livestock types. And it started uh, since the Hyogo framework for action and the momentum grew much stronger when the FAO uh, presented the draft methodology uh, in, in the uh, Sendai conference in March 2015, which received like very strong buy-in from member states for the need uh, uh, to, to have this uh, methodology that addresses specificity of agriculture. 
And after the Sendai, uh, the adoption of the Sendai conference in March 2015, FAO continued to further improve and advance the methodology um, and in close collaboration with the United Nations uh, Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, the, FAO, the methodology was approved and adopted by member states in the open ended intergovernmental expert working group on disaster risk reduction in Geneva in 2017. And throughout 2018, we have been working closely with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, to ensure that um, the, the methodology will be fully uh, reflected and then adopted for the Sendai framework indicator C2. Um, as you can see on the right slide uh, of this, the right side of, of this slide, uh, the uh, FAO um, methodology uses a standardized computation method to assess the direct damage and loss that occurs in the agriculture sectors as a result of disasters, which takes into the considerations of all the agricultural, um, the specificity of each of the five subsectors, namely crops, livestock, forestry, aquaculture, and fishery. And the computation, I would like to inform you that the computation of the methodologies is presented in details in the technical annex of the uh, FAO latest report that I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, as well as in the guidance notes for the damage and loss assessment in agriculture. And these two resources have already been made available to all participants through the uh, webinar website. Um, um, so in this slide, you, you see that the three components of the FAO damage and loss methodology are presented in a matrix table. They are production damage, production loss, and asset damage. So starting with the terminology uh, damage, we define damage uh, as the replacement or repair cost of totally or partially destroyed physical assets and stocks in the disaster affected areas. Um, a loss refers to the changes in economic flows arise from disasters, that is, the declines in outputs in crops, livestock, forestry, fishery, and aquaculture. So as you could see uh, on this slide, production damage is the value of destroyed store inputs and production outputs. Uh, production loss is the difference between expected and actual value of production, and the asset damage is the cost to repair or replace damage or destroyed assets. So um, this slide here summarizes the uh, total effects of disasters in agriculture presented in the five equation uh, here with the three key components, again, production damage, production loss, and asset damage across all of the, uh, the, the, the subsectors. Now, zooming into the um, um, closer to the methodology um, here, is an example on how we compute C2 uh, indicator for the crop impact. So C2 crop sector impact is the sum of annual crop production damage, perennial crop production damage, annual crop production loss, perennial crop production loss, and crop asset damage, complete, both complete and partially damaged assets. So for the crop sectors, uh, we are looking at both annual and perennial crops. Um, in order and after than earlier, in order to present the full characteristic of the damage and loss in each of the subsectors, we are looking at three components production damage, production loss, and asset damage. So, for the crop production damage, we are looking at the following aspects first, the pre disaster value of destroyed inputs, second, pre disaster value of destroyed store crops, annual and perennial, and third, the replacement value of fully damaged perennial trees. And for production loss, we compute the differences between expected and actual value of crop production in non-fully damaged harvested areas. The pre, uh, second, the pre-disaster uh, value of destroyed crop in fully damaged areas, non-harvested at all, and short-run post-disaster maintenance costs. And for the asset damage, we calculate um, pre-disaster value of partially or fully destroyed assets. So this uh, brings me to my next point, which I would like to make is that about data, data requirement and uh, data limitation and what it means in terms of practical reporting. So this is the uh, an ideal case scenario. Um, uh, 
in ideal case scenario, this is this is how it looks like. So you will have all of the um, the data and information uh, for each of the sub um, sectors sub components here. So uh, in the uh, production damage. Um, you will have all of this uh, detail of the information and data that lives here uh, in this slide. I will not go through in all, in all of the detail. And for production loss, you will have the um, all of the detail as uh, presented in, in this slide and, uh, and the same for asset damage. So uh, the point we would like to make is that um, with this availability of data, you will understand, you, it will allow you to be able to understand and have a holistic understanding of what went on in the agriculture sector following the disasters. So, uh, but having said that, let me okay. So slide here, a slide, this slide also uh, show that um, the methodology can also function with a minimum or limited data availability. However, it's still very important to uh, have the disaggregation by, by commodity types. Um, um, this means that the methodology can work with a wide range of spectrum of data availability, and also uh, it can work with quite few data. And, um, Taking this opportunity, as I would also like to inform you that the uh, data, the optimum data and uh, minimum data requirement um, are provided in the technical annex of the report and also of the uh, guiding notes that I mentioned earlier, which are already made available for all of the participants to this webinar. Um, in fact, I also, with interest, in the interest of time, I will not be able to go through all of the other four subsectors of, of the um, of the agriculture sector, but uh, the presentation will be made available uh, to all participants after the webinar. So it's in the slide uh, hidden mode so that you cannot see. In fact, I would like to show you how, how, how it looked like in, in brief for the crop sector, uh, for the livestock sector, for the aquaculture, fishery, and um, yes, forestry. So then uh, now I would like to move to the next one here. So um, I would like to, 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 to share with you with uh, this e-learning course that FAO developed. So um, this in, with this e-learning course, you um, can learn about the concept of FAO damage and loss and, uh, and also how they are calculated, what are the data requirements, data source, and also looking into the importance of the institutional collaboration for data collection and analysis and how the damage and loss um, can be data can be used at the global level uh, and also to inform national policy um, and uh, planning. So this e-learning course is available free of charge at the FAO e-learning academy. Uh, it's about two hours. So uh, if uh, those for those of you who are interested to learn more about, about the, uh, the FAO damage and loss methodology, please feel free to, to, um, to go to the website. And I think that you will, you will enjoy this. Um, this led me to my last slide. Um, so here uh, to, to conclude, I know that my time is running out. Um, despite the, the many good progress that we have made, I think um, from, from the FAO perspective, greater progress and capacity development support are still much needed in order to improve national damage and loss information system in order to collect and report data on disaster related loss in agriculture and further support if needed at country level, including uh, reaching out to and facilitate data collection and monitoring at sub national level in order to uh, meet the, the global commitment linking once the national system are functioning. And lastly, uh, we need to work together in order to further generate greater evidence for policy making in disaster risk reduction disaster risk management and climate change actions in the agriculture sector. With this, I would like to inform that, as I mentioned by our previous speaker, Thomas, um, that there's still some challenges in, in reporting uh, in terms of the adaptation. So from the FAO side, um, we are about to commence our collaboration with the Potsdam Climate Research Institute and the University of Glasgow to develop uh, a methodology building on the current one that the damage and loss methodology that, that FAO have, has been uh, uh, implementing in order to distinguish and quantify the proportion of production losses in agricultural crop yields 
uh, by extreme event and slow onset events as part of the overall uh, climate change impact. So this is not an easy task. It's still working in process. Um, we hope to, to, to start the, the research very soon and hopefully that in the next six months, we would be able also to come up with some key uh, uh, findings to be able to, to meet with all of you again. Uh, but, but it's still working in, in, in progress and uh, it's, um, we hope that we will be uh, successful in, in this endeavor. With this, um, I would like to thank uh, you for your attention. And um, I put here also the contact in case you are interested in, in um, to learn more about, uh, to, to reach out to us, please feel free to write us at fao-dr at fao.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Viria, and also Elisa for uh, a comprehensive yet concise um, presentation. Um, in this limited time, it is understandable that we can't go into all the details, but I, um, I am sure that participants will appreciate the information that you're going to share with us um, in the slides, uh, Viria. And now that we have you here, uh, may I ask you a few of the questions that, um, that are posted regarding the topic of loss and damage. Uh, one of our participants is asking, you mentioned methodological and practical restrictions for adaptation, um, monitoring and evaluation. Um, I wonder if there are additionally some conceptual restrictions for the loss and damage. In my experience, we'll still have difficulties to conceive um, loss and damage or vulnerability beyond economic uh, categories. I think to some extent you responded to it during your presentation, but we would appreciate another um, go on it um, and and also there's a, there are two other questions related to loss and damage one is um the contamination of uh of rivers um and lakes and oceans from leaching toxic chemicals are the damage caused by that is counted in any way in this uh in um in the loss and damage assessment and the other question is about um it is important to differentiate the loss and damage caused by climate change from other than caused by natural climate variability. So um, how, how do we approach these uh, topics? I think that's that's all on, the, on this topic. And then there's another question for Elisa that I will ask later. Um, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you. So there's a very, very good, many, many questions. I hope I would be able to, to, to capture all of the questions that you mentioned the microphone. My headset doesn't work quite well. So the, the challenges for the climate, for the uh, from from outside in terms of reporting, uh, first of all, which is the uh, limitation of the data availability. In some cases, uh, sometimes you have to deal with very very um, minimum data that you have. So, but with the methodology, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the uh, data desegregation, so uh, by by crop and by commodity types that would, uh, that help us enable us to be able to come up with some of the, the good uh, enough uh, um, assessment from, from, from the losses. Uh, more uh, work needs to be done in order to, to build a greater uh, capacity in terms of like uh, the national uh, data, data damage and loss information system to, to make sure that it is functioning. And then as you see, if you go deeper into, into the, at the country level, sometimes the, the stakeholders that we are uh, working with so in the case of Chile, we are working closely with the Ministry of Agriculture, who take the lead in, in terms of the uh, supporting the, uh, the institutionalization of the uh, damage and loss system that FAO has implemented, right? And then while in Armenia, you will see that uh, the, it is the Ministry of uh, um, Emergency, the DRR focal point, who, who is the one who take the lead, the champion in, in uh, taking up the, uh, the, um, the institutionalization and the implementation implementation of the damage and loss information system. And at the same time, in, uh, in the other case in Nepal, you have the, the National Statistics Office, who is the lead. So um, we, in, in, there's no one uh, size fits all. So in terms of uh, what we have done so far with our capacity development support to countries, it's first of all, it's really to, to understand what exists at the uh, specific to, to country context. And then we, we have a, a multi-stakeholder um, dialogue uh, kind of a discussion with the national government, uh, multi-stakeholder, then we come up with a roadmap in order to how to go about it. But uh, this is something that, that we, we are still um, trying to, 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 to address because as I mentioned earlier, each country has different contexts. And then um, the, I did not get the second question. If you could repeat, or I can also address through, through the, uh, the writing if, if it is already available in, in the 
the I think your function. response was very much uh, was very much a fit for for both questions that I asked. Um, one of the colleagues is asking how does the methodology work? Is it online or not? And you could probably respond that in the chat uh, in writing if if that's not a problem. Thank you very much, Viria. Um, going back to Thomas, um, I understand that you uh, typed the answer to the question that was about the metrics for measuring adaptation regarding the global goal for adaptation, but um, I would also like to ask Thomas if he has any thoughts on the questions that we asked Viria on the conceptual um, limitation when it comes to to defining loss and damage, um, and if you would like to add any other points um, uh, at this stage. Thomas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I, unfortunately, uh, my, my sound cut out a bit in, um, in uh, Miriam's answer, but um, yeah, I, I think the in terms of um, limitations to to defining loss and damage, I, as I touched upon briefly in my presentation, and, and apologies if I'm if I'm repeating any of this. Um, you know, is the fact that uh, you know at the moment um, conceptualizing loss and damage is is to a large extent stuck in the um, economic direct economic costs, which is um, you know from the costs directly caused by uh, extreme weather events and sharp shocks. Um, and I think uh, in terms of methodo method methodologically speaking, um, there needs to be some improvement in uh, assessing the costs of, of indirect costs, so the costs um, that occur after the event, but are still due to the initial shock, but not necessarily to the impacts of the shock itself. Uh, so in terms of an extreme weather event, this could be like loss in tourism or, you know, long lasting effects of, of uh, yeah, these uh, impacts. And, and then also there, there is definitely a lot of, it's really difficult to quantify in a way that's uh, useful and applicable to everyone, the non-economic costs of uh, climate impacts. And so th this can be really intangible things like a, a loss of sense of being, uh, it can be a loss of territory, a loss of cultural sites. And, you know, these are, for many reasons, really hard to quantify in a way um, that truly captures the losses that are actually occurring uh, in in the long term, and also allocate you know attributing these to to climate change is is even even more difficult than it that it is with sharp sharp economic uh, shocks, which of course has its own methodological uh, differences. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Um... Uh, I hope if there's any other questions, we could answer them in the chat uh, or in a written format. Um, Elisa, uh, yeah. I would like to come to you to kind of wrap up uh, this Q&A part uh, with a question. Um, while methodological challenges are recognized, are there recommended evaluation approach to adaptation? I know that it's a little broader than the scope of this uh, event, which is focused on loss and damage, but I thought it might be um, worth trying to at least give us a bigger picture and zoom out again and put this topic in the context of um, adaptation reporting, um, particularly with the focus on m &E. please. Yes, um, I will be brief since we have two speakers from the countries, uh, but uh, there, is, there are no silver bullets with regard to, I would expand the, the answer, not only to evaluation, but monitoring and evaluation of adaptation. Um, we recognize uh, the limitation that we discussed briefly in the presentation. FAO proposes uh, a potential uh, flexible and um, a consistent framework for tracking adaptation in the agricultural sector has developed um, a framework recognizing the fact that there is the need to um, uh, understand the relationship when assessing uh, the, um, the effectiveness, adequacy and sustainability of the adaptation uh, um, action and responses. Uh, by looking at the relationship uh, with, with, between the climatic context, the environmental context, the socioeconomic and the institutional and policy systems. So we propose a methodology which is called TAS, uh, Tracking Adaptation in the Agricultural Sector. Uh, I share the link uh, with, uh, in the chat box. Uh, but basically this is a compilation of uh, 109, 110 indicators. We look at how, how you can assess adaptation progress in the same sectors 
crops, livestock, forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture that we actually use to um, apply and assess the loss and damage um, uh, methodology. So we, again, look at four main uh, categories of indicators, and uh, we propose a methodology for assessing um, adaptation progress. Uh, so, but then there are many other uh, on the field, on the ground, um, the tools that can be, can be applied. We have in particular one which is called SHARP um, that we have been promoting also in the, as part of the, um, the CPTA Polo project. And again, I can share, it's like a field assessment tool uh, for assessing adaptation and resilience of farmers and pastoralists. Again, I'll share the link uh, on, the, on the chat box. Thank you very much, Elisa, and we will make sure to add those links and any other resources uh, that was mentioned today on the event webpage. So I invite um, all participants to keep an eye on that page also for the recording and slides um, after the conclusion of the event. Um, with that, I would like to conclude this Q&A part. Uh, as Elisa mentioned, we have two country representatives um, that will share their practical experiences um, uh, from the field with us. But before that, um, may I ask for all of us uh, to participate in this poll that is going to be launched in a second? You see the questions. Do, um, does your country already report on loss and damage? And if so, through which channels? But I would like to thank you everyone for, for your participation. Um, in this next part, we are pleased to be joined by representatives from Bangladesh and Mongolia and hear practical examples from their efforts on loss and damage related assessments, actions and reporting. Um, we'll start with Bangladesh and Mr. Imtiaz Ahmed, uh, who will provide an example of how anticipatory loss and damage assessment uh, can help to reduce the climate change related impacts. This presentation is pre-recorded, uh, but Imtiaz is present for any questions or comments you may have. Um, uh, I would like to ask our tech support colleagues to play the presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone from Bangladesh. So I'm here to present the anticipatory flood response that we did for 2020 monsoon floods in Bangladesh, uh, the impact-based forecasting model that we utilize and the methodology that we utilize to assess the impacts. So. Uh, Bangladesh has a long history of DSR management. Uh, however, the country's current uh, DSR management plan, as well as standing orders on disaster, is heavily founded on uh, the Sendai framework and Paris Agreement. Uh, these two documents actually explicitly lays the foundation for focus based uh, financing or anticipatory action. So, taking this opportunity, uh, OTA introduced an anticip anticipatory action framework. Uh, which is based on flood forecast model with a return period of five years for the Jumuna Basin. This is actually a two-stage trigger system uh, with uh, a 10 days for trigger one and five days before the flood peak. So to develop this model for trigger one, we used low fast forecasting data. And for trigger two, we used the National Flood Forecasting Warning Center's forecast model. So based on this, uh, the most uh, flood affected areas and the estimation of population and loss of assets was used to develop a composite index and uh, finally to develop the impact based forecasting model uh, to select the priority or target areas. So as you can see, the trigger one was uh, turned on 4 July. Uh, while the trigger two uh, was activated on 11 July. And this is the flood condition that uh, map that was developed using uh, the data, inundation data on 15 July. And uh, as you can see that uh, last year's flood was among one of the highest in the last 35 years. Uh, to respond to this, FA actually delivered two kinds of assistance. Uh, some 7,000 households received sea level drums to uh, valuing around $11, and some 11,000 households received uh, animal feed uh, valuing around $24. So, although by principle, uh, 
anticipatory assistance is supposed to be delivered before flood peak. Uh, the trigger was activated almost one month before anticipated time. And so we had little preparation. However, we managed to cover uh, all uh, the target that we had uh, for the response within uh, flood peaks. However, from the unspent, unspent funds, we made additional distributions uh, and that was a bit delayed due to Eid and other events. The timeline was significant because uh, following the floods, there was Idul Azha, uh, when the largest uh, livestock sales take place in the country as a Muslim country. And also the almond planting time that uh, contributes to the large bulk amount of uh, food grain in the country. So to assess the impact, we did a counterfactual analysis. We had 384 beneficiary households and 413 non-beneficiary households, as well as we collected human interest stories to have qualitative insights. So the assessment actually had five pillars. The first one uh, being food security, then coping strategy, then estimation of avoided loss, and return on direct investment and beneficiary perception. So in terms of food consumption, we didn't find much of a difference apart from that the beneficiary houses, less number of beneficiary houses reported uh, poor food consumption status. In terms of coping strategy, we didn't find any significant difference either. However, in terms of loan, we found that uh, beneficiary households were less likely to take new loans uh, and the size was smaller and also non-beneficiaries spend more loan money to buy animals and food. Uh, the syllable drums, the, uh, the beneficiaries reported were useful and uh, it was able to save the seeds. However, we they reported a contradictory uh, picture for uh, the amount of food that they were able to save using the drums. In terms of livestock mortality, we found that the beneficiary households reported less mortality, while uh, only for cattle, in terms of animal health, we had a contradictory picture where the non beneficiaries reported uh, lesser a deterioration in body condition. We also tried to analyze the difference between early and late assistance. Uh, by late, we are defining those receiving assistance uh, after the flood peak. Um, however, we didn't find much of a difference. However, we've, the small difference that we found that the late recipients spend more money on livestock and uh, they had a lower food consumption status. Uh, so then all these avoided losses were converted into monetary values, uh, translated as value of assets and production. And uh, the difference was again then compared with the total project cost. And we found that per dollar spent, uh, the return of investment was 80 cents. However, the beneficiaries felt that this assistance was useful to protect their livestock when there was no feed available or even protect their seeds that they used to plant in the coming uh, next growing season. And uh, they felt that the intervention was effective and timely. However, they also opted that further complementary assistances were required, uh, especially cash, uh, livelihood, uh, food, and more feed. Another important finding was that 68% of the respondents reported that their local markets from where they source their inputs, food, and animal feed were not fully functional during the times of the flood. And also the livestock feed recipients reported of receiving 20% higher prices uh, compared to their counterfactuals when selling their cattle. Uh, there was another OCHA assessment that followed soon after this assessment, uh, two rounds. Uh, it had two rounds and the findings more or less align. Uh, it's notable here that uh, FAO beneficiaries had one of the highest rates of recovery compared to other responding agencies. 
So for FAO, the key takeaway was that FAO was able to test its capacity and experience in a fast setting hazard contest, uh, context. Um, also, we realized that we should further fine tune the trigger mechanism because often we found that low fast and uh, FFWC forecast contradicting and there are certain errors to the uh, design. Also, flexible financing and pre-positioning is required for further agility, uh, along with layered and coordinated action by responding engines. So for 2021, we are actually doing common household profiling, a multi-agency one, and planning for complementary assistance, combining cash and NFIs by different agencies, along with early warning messaging, also, we found that uh, apart from the Department of DSR Management, the other technical agencies involved in uh, livestock and agriculture rural sector, uh, they need more sensitization. And this needs to be further integrated with social protection and resilience programming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um for this presentation. Um, I understand that we are behind the agenda. I apologize to everyone for any inconvenience caused. And without further ado, uh, we will go to our colleague from Mongolia, uh, Ench uh, Amgalan Ayurzana. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, to share Mongolia's experience in developing and testing a framework for climate change related loss and damage. And thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Okay, so I was allocated seven minutes, yes, okay, <laughs> I would be short. Okay, I represent Center for Pulse Research, it's an independent think tank, and we are engaged mostly in livestock agriculture development issues and asked to represent on this issue. So Mongolia is, you know, one of the hardest hit countries by climate change. Uh, and also, this is just brief information. This about Mongolia, the cut between China and Russia is very high altitude country, very harsh uh, winter, minus 25 degrees in the, uh, in the winter, and very one of the emptiest, I think, number one emptiest country is 3.2 million people on. 1.5 million square kilometers of land and agriculture is uh, quite big, 12% of GDP and almost one fourth of employment. And livestock herding is a major economic activity and social safety net for poor Mongolians. And Mongolian agriculture is of course uh, absolutely dependent on harsh and highly variable uh, natural environment. And as a result, uh, productivity is very low for both animals and also for crop. We have very low crop yield per hectare and low animal productivity. And of course, the advantage of this harsh natural environment is that uh, Mongolian livestock produces uh, potentially ecologically clean products. You know, 95% is based on uh, grass feed, you know, natural pastures. So this is just a uh, general uh, situation of Mongolia. It's mostly located in non-suitable uh, zone by international you know, zone by FAO here. So this, uh, for example, crop yield is, is only one ton com uh, compared to our neighbors, two, three tons in, uh, two tons in Russia and in other countries. Milk yield is very low, six, uh, 600 liters per cow per year. And this uh, it's just a general assessment of how climate change is uh, impacts Mongolian agriculture. And this is uh, actually climate change vulnerability index uh, estimates by Nature uh, Minister of Environment and Tourism Development. Currently, Mongolia stands here, but in two, 2050. This vulnerability increase in many, many provinces in, in general because of this increase, increase in the temperature and, and drying out as Mongolia becomes more uh, vulnerable to climate change. And in 2019, it was the first attempt to uh, estimate uh, 
damage and loss, agriculture damage and loss. It was actually a FEO project, strengthening disaster demand and loss information, mainly in agriculture, supervised by Ms. Hank Fan Farm. And we, we actually produced historical agricultural damage and loss database for 2005-2018 for 14 years in line with FAO methodology. And we have reviewed and uh, also made some diagnosis of the national agriculture damage and loss information management and reporting system and produced some recommendations. And recommendations for setting up of, of agriculture damage and loss information management system also, the recommendations include how to integrate agriculture, damage, and loss data into national SINDAI framework monitoring and reporting, and also continued sharing of agriculture damage and loss data with national uh, disaster management authority. So, major risks we have uh, included in our estimates, uh, you know, we, we have drought and also ZUT. This is very much Mongolia specific winter disaster. A combination of snow and extreme temperature making animals unable to graze and starve to death. And transboundary disease, it's, it's also another issue also impacted by climate change. Of course, livestock theft is not very much climate change related, but it's, again, it's uh, also one of the biggest uh, risks or losses uh, who does actually uh, suffer. So it is also included uh, in our estimates. Storm and wind, uh, this is the uh, last one. And for crop, we also uh, estimate drought, hail, and the snow. So this is uh, just general uh, summary table of what kind of uh, uh, natural disasters were estimated and how much is the total uh, damage and loss. As you can see here for this uh, 2005 and 2018, total loss, total was total damage and loss was around 1.6 trillion. Uh, Mongolian Tugriks is around uh, 800 million US dollar. Out of this total amount, almost 84% belongs to this uh, drought and zut, the mostly zut, you know, this winter disaster. And others also account for little percent, uh, percentages like uh, transboundary disease and followed by hair. And this again shows this uh, big disasters happens in 2009-2010 because of this uh, Mongolia lost around almost one fourth of total livestock to the winter disaster zot. So this is it's a major event uh, affecting Hoytos livelihoods and also biggest uh, uh, damage. But this actually uh, just key findings. So key uh, barrier to prepare and use an adequate damage and loss estimates is the lack of clarities. We got the roles and functions and coordination on agriculture damage and loss estimates among involved agencies like Ministry of Food Agriculture, National Emergency Management Authority, and National Statistics Office. These are three major authorities engaged in data collection, reporting, and disaster management. There is some uh, lack of uh, clarities and also some overlapping functions. As a result, uh, there is no long-term historical data we aggregated and subsequent damage and loss assessment was undertaken to inform relevant stakeholders, including uh, Sendai framework. So this is a major issue, lack of uh, data, historical data. And capacities and commitment of relevant or organizations are also low to, to uh, uh, collection and uh, reporting of this damage and loss data. And also there is a serious lack of data to estimate losses. We have quite good uh, information and data on damage, like uh, lost animals, you know, killed animals by zot. But uh, loss or 
productivity loss data is very much lacking, missing. Uh, this is uh, just recommendations we, we, we put forward for government. Firstly, Mafali, Minister of Food and Agriculture and National Studies of need to work together to make sure that lost data required by the provided template will be collected. This template was actually provided by uh, FAO. It was good template and this template was suggested to be feeded in regularly, annually by districts and integrate that uh, provincial level and national levels. Second was... Uh, um, Dr. Emch, uh, if I may come in, just in the interest of time, um, would you mind um, sh um, wrapping up the presentation at this point, um, noting that the presentations will be shared with participants so okay, they will okay. have time to read the slides, but it, we, we would love to hear a few closing words from you. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, thank you. That's all. You can read all these recommendations and uh, happy to uh, present to this workshop and thank you very much. Thank you so much um, and, and Imtiaz for very, very informative presentations. I am sure there's a lot of questions um, and a lot to be learned from your experiences. Unfortunately, we don't have time for a QA and a segment at this point, but if you don't mind, it would be great if you share your contact um, in the chat box. So if colleagues have any questions, could reach out bilaterally. Um, okay. I am afraid that we have to close the session at this point. Um, I believe we managed um, to cover a lot of grounds in this limited time, thanks to excellent presentations and engagement by all panelists and participants. Um, to wrap up the discussion, I would like to invite Fatima Zahra Taibi from the GSP to take the floor, share her thoughts on the discussions, um, as well as possible next steps to keep up the capacity building work for enhanced transparency in adaptation reporting. Um, Fatima Zahra, I would also like to express our appreciation on behalf of the FAO Transparency Team to you and your outstanding team for an excellent collaboration for the organization of this event, um, and obviously beyond that. The floor is yours. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the panelists for a very interesting and informative uh, uh, in interventions. Uh, they both showed the amount of work that needs to be done uh, to meet the requirements of the UNFCCC in this area but also the available tools, some of the available tools and the progress made in some countries through the case studies that we have seen. So I'm pleased to, to see so much interest in this webinar from the participants. And I would like to thank you for uh, your active participation and all the interactions and the interesting questions we have seen uh, throughout this webinar. I would like also to appreciate the FAO team and thank them for inviting us to collaborate in this event that is timely. We have very good experiences in collaborating with the, the FAO in delivering some interventions to support countries and respond to their needs in the area of transparency and to prepare them for the upcoming BTR. So just earlier this month, as has been mentioned earlier, we have organized a three-day training on reporting on adaptation through the BTR. One of the main uh, takeaways from that training was the great needs from countries on the topic of reporting on adaptation in general and loss and damage in particular, and the eagerness to learn more and see some practical tools and examples. That's how the idea of this webinar uh, has generated. So as to follow up on the requests and needs that were expressed during that training. Uh, it presents a good example of uh, synergetic and complementary uh, interventions by partners and a good example of joint efforts. It is therefore very important that participants and countries in general are vocal with their specific needs because as support organizations and initiatives, it is very helpful for us to, uh, so as to ensure that we are responding uh, to, uh, to your needs uh, directly and in, uh, immediately and uh, like in a timely way. 
So one uh, also of the learnings from that training and this webinar is the big interest in this uh, subject. So this is certainly an area that warrants further attention, uh, both due to its novelty, but also to the methodological challenges that its assessment presents. We see that there is an appetite for more targeted trainings in this topic, and we will make sure to take that into account when planning further capacity building interventions in, uh, in the near future. So uh, for your information, uh, the Global Support Program is now preparing its second phase that will start towards the end of this year. We will continue with the transparency uh, networks that we currently have uh, all over the, the globe. We have currently 13 networks. We will seek uh, synergies and collaborations with the networks established via other initiatives as well. And we will be very closely uh, listening to you so as to tailor our interventions in a way that responds to your needs. We will also be seeking synergies and collaborations with other organizations and initiatives such as the FAO in order to uh, avoid duplication and put skill, our skills and resources together uh, to best respond to the needs. So stay tuned for more news on the GSP uh, phase two that will also include the one-stop shop for capacity building through merging the CDIT platform and the GSP website. So with that, I would like to thank you again uh, all for your active participation. Uh, thank the FAO team and all the panelists for informative presentations. And uh, we hope to see you soon in uh, uh, future events. Thank you very much. And back to you, Suzanne. Thank you very much. We couldn't conclude this event any better. Thank you so much um, to Fatima Zahra, also our distinguished speakers, and of course, all the participants for enriching the discussions today. Um, just as the final note, the recording of this session will be made available online shortly, together with the slides and presentation and all the other resources that were mentioned. Um, if you'd like to stay in touch, as Fatima Zahra mentioned, you can join us um, in our network and also uh, reach out to us at the email address um, etf at signfao.org. I wish you all a great rest of day, night, depending on where you are. Hope to see you soon in future episodes of the ETF webinar series and other um, capacity building sessions. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good day.